Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, I, first, I want to say thank you to everyone here running the conference. Um, it's amazing. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very, very much for having me. Um, I've never been to St. Augustine before, and it's very beautiful. Um, so I want to say happy Friday. Happy Friday, everyone. Woo! Friday. Yeah, we made it. Yes. OK. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something that probably no other speaker asks you to do. Uh, I want you to get on the internet right now. <laughs> actually, actually, OK, hold on, hold on. We're, we're going to try out a little, we're doing a little test here. OK, get on the internet, and I need you to tweet this at me. Do at tenderlove photo me. Uh, we're going to try, we're going to see what, we're going to test out Twitter's rate limits or the Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Let's see if it's actually working. Is anybody, has anybody tweeted at me? Am I on the right Wi-Fi? Uh oh. Oh, there we go. There's one. Okay. Oh, let me hold on. Let me pose. Hello. Are people tweeting? Is it working? Is it working? Those of you that have tweeted at me? Yeah. Okay. You can do it more. Oh, okay. So, um, what I have done is I have set up a daemon here that's running on my machine that anytime you tweet at tenderlove photo me, it will take a photo of me from the <laughs> webcam here and reply to you. <laughs> reply to you on Twitter. So if at any time you want to see what I look like while I'm up here. <laughs> and I made sure to wash my face before this. So hopefully it won't look too crazy. And actually, you can do uh, at tenderlove photo me. The regex is like at tenderlove photo me dot star. So you can do anything after that, and it'll, it's OK. Uh, you can get the code here. So go there, and you can go look up the code for this. Um, so my name is Aaron Patterson. I'm on the internet as Tenderlove. I noticed that somebody here is wearing Google Glasses. Uh, I also have a Google Glass at home. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the Ruby core team, and I'm also on the Rails core team. And this doesn't mean I, that I know what I'm talking about. It just means that I'm terrible at saying no. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I work out. I work. Uh, I work for a very small startup out of uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm a remote worker for this company. You might have heard of them. It's AT and T. Um, <laughs> yes, I work for AT and T as an open source open source programmer. That is what I do. Um, so yesterday was extremely awesome. I had a great time at this conference. Uh, Leon talked about caves, and that's really awesome because I live in a cave. Uh, I don't really get out much. Um, Katrina had many takeaways in her, in her talk. And uh, where I'm from, we call those to goes, not takeaways. <laughs> Richard talked about testing the untestable, which I thought was very interesting uh, because he didn't really answer the question. I mean, if it's untestable, how you can't test it. It's by definition untestable. How is this possible? <laughs> Anyway, I went on a ghost tour, and I thought that was really cool because I met a bunch of investigators <laughs> <laughs> who presented lots of evidence. <laughs> and every time they said investigator or evidence, all I could imagine in my hair, in my head, was like air. I'm like mentally doing air quotes all the time. <laughs> and I was just thinking. Then we started talking about it. I was thinking about what if they were air, like air smart quotes? So it'd be like this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I love, I love programming. I love programming a lot. Uh, programming is my hobby. I, it's also my job. I'm super happy that I can do it every day. Um, specifically, I love Ruby programming. I love Ruby programming a lot. And the reason I work on open source stuff as my job is because like, you know, I, I mainly work on Rails. I'm paid to basically do whatever open source stuff I want to do, but I mostly do Rails. And the reason I do that is because Rails is what gave me a job to be a Ruby programmer. I love Ruby so much, and I want everybody else to be able to do Ruby as their job, too. So I work on Rails so that um, companies will continue to use it, and we can continue to have jobs programming Ruby. Uh, so anyway, I'm paid to do this. I feel obligated to talk about like work stuff, so I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to first talk about, like, I'm going to start with business up front, and then when we're done with that, we're going to party in the back. And yes, this is a mullet talk. <laughs> that is me. I do look, I look very young. <laughs> It's, the hair is not real. It's not. OK. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to complain. This is like the first part I'm just going to complain. I'm straight up complaining. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to talk about Rack. 
Um, I think that Rack is shackling us, and uh, this is going to be fairly specific about with uh, Rails internals and stuff. So um, if you don't really understand, don't worry about it. Like just tune out and wait for the uh, back end of the mullet. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to talk about Rack, the shackles of Rack. And I want to talk about this in terms of streaming. Like, basically, I want streaming. I think the future of the web, it's very important for us to have streaming. We need to be able to stream to our clients so that we can reduce latency. Uh, I want to get data out to the clients quickly, as quickly as possible. And you see this with technologies like Node. I mean, Node makes it very easy to stream stuff out to the client. And I want to do this in Ruby. Frankly, I hate JavaScript. So. <laughs> And I will talk, happily talk to people about that later. Anyway, so another important part about doing streaming is I think that we can actually gain some performance benefits out of supporting this in Rails. Supporting streaming as a first class citizen. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. Like, here's an example of how uh, streaming could work as we say, like, on the, on the left side, we have our server code, and on the right side, we have app code. And the app says, OK, write some data out to the client. And in Rails, we automatically do um, HTML escaping for you if, you're, if your string is not marked as HTML safe. And what's cool is if we had this buffer that we actually wrote to, we could have a background process saying, like, OK, pop off the buffer. If that thing is uh, not HTML safe, make it HTML safe, then write out. Otherwise, just write the thing out. So we could actually have some parallelism going inside of our application. So we could actually do two things at once. This is concurrent friendly. Now, uh, unfortunately, today's safe buffer looks something like this, where you say, OK, take a safe string and concat it to another safe string, or concat a non-safe string onto that. And we have to do all that checking right at that moment, and we're buffering all this stuff up. This is not concurrent friendly. It's because you may use the return value of that. We have to have that return value back around. When you write to the, when you write to the buffer, we know you're not going to use that anymore. It's like, OK, we're writing this to the buffer. Go. Anyway. I also think that uh, today, so today what we do in Rails, the base use case, what most people do is they assemble a page together. That page gets assembled into one very large buffer and gets sent out to the client. Uh, so Rails buffers the entire page currently. Now, there's a dirty little secret I have to tell, which is that streaming may not actually stream. And to understand why this is, we have to take a look at what the write system call does. Like, for example, if you have this file and you say file.write, you write some data out to it, it may not actually write to the file system. It may buffer that. So Ruby has internal, internal buffers that save, your, save that data in memory and then write it out to the system call. And even your system has buffers where if you write, if you use the write system call, it may buffer that before actually flushing to the file system. So when we say write, it may not actually write. There's actually a small buffer involved there. So what if we just grew that buffer? What if that buffer became infinite? Or what if it was the size of a page? Well, you can imagine like that's how buffering should work. Like That's how we should support a full in-memory buffer. We can say that buffering is a form of streaming. right? Buffering is a form of streaming where the streaming's buffer size is very large. So in Rails today, uh, we have a stack that looks basically like this. So we have an adapter that sits here between your, or we're going to look at streaming in Rails today. We have an adapter that sits there between Rack and your controller. That's streaming adapter, and we're going to take a look at that a little bit. Uh, so the streaming interface in Rails looks a little bit like this. We say, OK, uh, add a header on the response, and then we're going to do this loop and write to the stream. So every five seconds, it's going to write out to the stream. And our stream looks like an I.O. object. We want to treat that stream as if it's an I.O. object. So if you know how to use an I.O., you know how to use streaming. So how does it work? Uh, and I don't actually have enough time to tell you this, because I have 172 slides. So I'm going to hand wave over this a lot. Um, so this is basically, <laughs> basically the gist of things is that we have, on the left side, we have your app code. And on the right side, we have the middleware. That middleware isn't exactly what it is. Like, I'm just using a bunch of lambdas to represent the middleware. Like, that's how the rack stack works, is you take all these lambdas and basically chain them together like this. So what happens it, today, we have two threads running. So when you want to do streaming in Rails, we have two threads. One is your app code. Your app code is run inside a thread, and the rack middleware is run inside another thread. And what happens is the request comes in, 
And it goes down this, down this lambda chain through the middleware. And all of a sudden, we get to the one that's like, OK, it's time to call Rails. It's time to call your controller. So then we say, OK, hey, controller, get ready. We call the controller. The controller writes the response. It adds headers. And then as soon as you call write on the stream, at that point, we say, oh, hey, other thread, rack middleware thread, it's OK for you to now return back up the stack. So it's like, OK, the user wanted to write there. We're going to return back up the stack. And then the web server is actually going to start writing data out. So how does Rack fit into this? Like, why is Rack really bothering me? I'm going to show you exactly why Rack is bothering me. Like, so this is what a Rack interface looks like. We have all you have to do to implement Rack is, or implement a Rack server is implement something that responds to call. And I've left out most of the objects just for clarity. So you, you have something that responds to call. It takes an environment, which is a hash of stuff. Um, and then you return a, an array that has three values in it, the status code, the headers as a hash, and then an output. The output has to respond to each. The web server loops over each and writes that out to the socket. So simple enough. Like, OK, this is great. Everybody was excited about this because it seems very easy to write a web service. Well, now we need to do resource management. So when a request comes in, we need to get a database connection and give you a database connection in your controller. So we say, OK, well, let's get the database connection, call the process, the process that actually processes your controller, then release the database connection. So we get that resource, and then we process your page, and then finally we disconnect from the database. So it seems pretty straightforward enough, right? It's very straightforward. We just get it, build up the page, disconnect. And now you can kind of see why we have to buffer in here. It's because we have to take that page. When you're done processing the page, then we can release the data. So then we think, OK, well, I want to implement a streaming server. Let's take a look at a very simple streaming server. This streams out hello world every half second. And the way this works, this works based on the fact that Rack calls each on your body. So we implement each up there. And we say, OK, you called each. I'm going to start feeding that block every half second. OK? So easy enough. But then we're like, well, you know, just like the previous page, we want to have a database connection in there. So let's connect to the database. We get the database. And then we say, OK, let's get the output. And then disconnect from the database. And then send the output to the web server. And this isn't going to work, because we return that object all the way back up to the web server. And the web server is like, OK, I'm going to call each. This thing tries to get rows from the database. But we don't have a database connection anymore. So this obviously won't work. Our cleanup code is wrong. So we have to fix our cleanup code. And the way we do this looks like this. We have to implement close. Rack will call close on the object. So we say, OK, as soon as you close that file handle, I want you to disconnect from the database. Now, the other problem is we have to deal with error handling. Like, What happened if there was an error during streaming? So we have to rescue and say, OK, well, you, did, you messed up when you were constructing the streaming object. We got an exception, and now we have to disconnect from the database. So now we have this repeated code here where we have to say, OK, I need to make sure that I close it here on close. Or if there is an exception, now I need to do it down here. So we have to repeat this code. The other problem we have is header management. So let's say you have some streaming code that looks like this. You add headers. That's great. Obviously, you can only add headers before you start streaming. If you started streaming, the headers have already been sent, and it doesn't matter whether or not you send headers anymore. They're not going not to make a difference. So what we, it means that you probably have a bug in your code, and what we want to do is raise an exception when you try to add a header. So we say, OK, let's, this is probably a bug right here. Uh, let's freeze these headers. So as soon as you call write, we want to just freeze the headers. So we freeze those headers on write. And what happens is then, as soon as you call add header, you get an exception. So we freeze the headers on write. You get an exception. You're notified, oh, I messed up in my code. I didn't actually want to add a header here because I've already started streaming out to, the, out to the system. So we have a flag that's like, OK, the user has written to the stream. We have to keep track of a flag whether or not you've written to the stream. So if you remember, though, if you remember our rack stack, any one of these middleware could actually try to write headers. And as we're returning back up the stack, we may not have actually written to the socket yet. So it's valid for any of these middleware to write to those headers. But as soon as the client code has written to the socket, we tried to freeze those. But that's not going to work, because these middleware need to write to it too. So now we need another flag. We have to have a flag that's like, well, have we actually written to the socket? 
If we've written to the socket, then we should raise an exception in the middleware. So we need two flags, one for, uh, so so far we have database cleanup code that's repeated, we have flags that are repeated, whether you know, the user has written or whether we've actually written to the socket. Um, so finally we get something that looks basically like this. This is a totally hand wavy implementation, but you can see here in each of the steps, these steps are completely disparate from each other, right? Not only that, but some of the steps are repeated. So you can't just look at a particular piece of code and figure out what the execution path is gonna look like. The responsibilities are scattered throughout the code. And the other problem is that every middleware needs to be, every middleware needs to know about these rules and implement these rules because if any middleware messes up, it ruins the bunch. So if you forget to call close on something, it's gonna mess up your entire stack and you don't know. Now my main gripe about it, the, the death knell for me is the env hash. This is the hash that gets passed into call. So if you think about this hash for a little bit, it's actually a global variable. And we know that global variables are bad. I hope I don't need to reiterate how bad they are, but I'm going to. So this is what happens. This is, we, get a, we get a user agent in the env hash. It's great. You can access anything about the request you want to know there. But eventually, you get middleware that are like, hey, I need to share some data. Let's share some data. And the only thing that they can share between each other is this env hash. So you get people who write stuff. And this is all, when I say people, I mean Rails core. So <laughs> this is our code. <laughs> so we say, OK, well, we need, to share, we need to share the cookie jar between two middleware. We have a session middleware that looks up your session. And we have another middleware that looks up the cookie jar. And we need to share that information between each other. But you'll notice that we have leaky knowledge. You have to know what that key is. Now it's in multiple places. Also, the order matters. If we don't execute this jar before we execute the session, uh, the session middleware, then it's not going to have a cookie jar in there. There's no way, like we need to make sure that that order is correct. So we have to know about that too. The other problem is we have no introspection. We can't know what's next. You can't look at a particular middleware and say, hey, I know what's going to be next in the stack. There's no API for that. The other problem is that everything is public. This app.session thing here, anybody could access this. So. There could be middleware in the world. They're like, I'm going to inject my own custom middleware for, I don't know, device or something in the middle of this, and I'm going to use, I'm going to get a hold of that app.session and I'm going to use it. Well, what if we on the Rails core team want to change that key? It's impossible. We can't do it and maintain backwards compatibility. Also, you end up with hilarious code. Hilarious. Should I do, which quote should I do? Hilarious code like this, so this is, this is actually an excerpt from the Rails code. Basically, we have at the top there a method called cookie jar, and you'll see that cookie jar method lazily puts an object into the rack environment hash. It's like, okay, is there a cookie jar there? If not, let's instantiate one and then shove it into the hash. And then we have another middleware somewhere else that's like, hey, let's look up the cookie jar. Uh, if there was a cookie jar there, let's do something. If there wasn't a cookie jar there, then we'll do something else. Now, what's really annoying about this is you can't tell, you know, what if this middleware is in the wrong place? You can't tell whether this middleware is in the wrong place or if nobody just called the method. I mean, maybe you're not getting any cookie jars in there all day long, and that's, you can't tell if maybe you, put, you made a mistake and put the middleware somewhere wrong or uh, if nobody is calling that method. Sometimes jar, sometimes not. Is the middleware in the right place? So my point with all of this is that Rack is encouraging bad patterns. Rack is encouraging bad patterns in our code. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that when you try to take into account these particular use cases, a lot of bad patterns arrive. We can't deprecate things safely. So on the core team, we can't say, hey, I want to change that key. None of this information is private to us. We can't safely change it and give you an upgrade path. There's no way for us to safely refactor this code. So when I look at that particular key with that particular cookie jar, I feel locked into it. I have to maintain that in order to maintain backwards compatibility. I'm shackled to this. So what I really want to do is I want to break the shackles with OO. I think we need to have something that's not based on some env hash. We need to have some kind of OO like defined API, and I don't have an entire answer for this, but I feel like maybe we need to steal from Node or steal from J2EE. There's ideas around there that we can steal from. And I have to say that this is, these are just a bunch of thoughts that I've been thinking about. This is very, 
bothering me in my day job and I just wanted to tell people about it. And unfortunately right now it's a very huge yak shave, so it's mostly just a little sparkle in my eye right now. <laughs> anyway, so if you want to talk about this stuff with me later, like come ping me. Um, I'm happy to talk about it or we can do it during the Q&A and I think now we're going to enter the um, party in the back <laughs> portion of my presentation that I like to call, oh, 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 it's magic, you know, <laughs> Magic the Gathering. Uh, does everybody, okay, how many people here play Magic the Gathering? A few. How many of you know what it is? Okay, many of you know what it is. So it is a collectible card game, for those of you that don't know. Um, it's a card game that's been around for at least 20 years. Um, I played it, so I started playing it in high school 20 years ago, and I didn't have any money then. And so like, actually maybe 18 years ago or so. Anyway, I didn't have any money, I didn't have a job. So I quit playing, because these cards cost money. And then maybe 10 years ago when I had a real job and expendable income and also no friends, I spent lots of money on this, ga on this game. <laughs> and I quit playing after a while because mainly, like, mainly because I went to it. So I was like, you know what, I'm playing, I'm gonna meet people. I go to a tournament, I'm like, I'm gonna play a tournament. So I played in a tournament and I just got destroyed by some 13 year old kid who like just slapped me in the face and insulted my mother. And it was like, it was basically like playing Call of Duty except in real life, just. <laughs> <sighs> Those kids are brutal, man. So <laughs> I quit. Anyway, recently somebody said, like, hey, Aaron, I'm they, going to a conference. I'm going to play. I'm playing Magic the Gathering again. Would you like to play? You know, does anyone else want to play? I'm like, yes, I have cards. I'd love to play. So I go open my closet. I look in the closet, and I have something like 6,000 cards. Right? And I'm like, man, that's a lot of cards. And... <laughs> Like I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this collection, and I have a bunch of I have a bunch of questions. I'm like, well, what do I have? Like, what cards do I have? Are are the cards any good? Like these cards, are they any good? Because some of them are good, some of them are bad. Um, and how much are the cards worth? Some of them are worth a lot of money, some of them are not. And I would like to know all this stuff, but there's so many of them. And I felt like, well, this you know process of like looking through all these freaking cards, like. This is a totally repetitive process, and we all know that computers are our slaves. They should do repetitive processes for us. So I wanted to make a computer do this, so I put on my robe and wizard hat and put together a system that would do this for me, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> Some of you got that joke. <laughs> Anyway, so let's look at the hardware. I'm going to talk about the hardware, then I'm going to talk about the software, and maybe mix it up a little bit in between. But this is what the hardware looks like. Uh, basically, I have my laptop there with a light box and a webcam. Uh, the webcam points down there into the light box, uh, and then it takes photos of the, of the card, so I put the card into the light box. And I'm going to show you a quick demo of what actually happens. So I've got a live feed. Over there on the right is a live feed from the camera. So we could do a live feed from the camera and do image detection at the same time. So I run this, come on video, there we go. I run it and you see there it brings up this thing. On the left is the card that it's extracted from the image and on the right, those right three cards are the cards that the system thinks it is. It's suggesting those to me as matches. So I just keep putting cards under. It recognizes the card on the left and then says, like, I think it's one of these on the right. And then I save it and say, okay, yes, you're right. That's the one. And it keeps on going. I just keep doing this over and over again. So the high-level process, excuse me, the high-level process is that we take a photo, we extract a card from the photo, then we identify the card, we try to recognize it, and then save the data for that. And I'm glossing over identifying the card. We're going to zoom in and talk about that here in a second. So card identification. The way this works is we start out with a corpus. I have a known corpus of cards. So I have all these images, and they're tied to some data. So I know that you know, this particular image ties to this particular card. So the system takes a guess based on that corpus of data. It says, like, OK, I took a picture. Based on all of these images in here, I'm going to try and guess which one it is. And then I'm going to prompt you and say, hey, Aaron, I think it's one of these. Uh, I'm pretty darn sure it's this one. Can you tell me if I'm right? 
And I tell it whether or not it's right. If it's right, I say so. If it's wrong, I tell it the right one. So I teach the system. And every time I do this, it saves that data and incre increases the corpus. So it's actually learned data. We have our main corpus and then learn data on top of that. And the idea is that every time we go through this, pr this process, the learned data gets larger and we get better at making guesses. So hopefully, eventually, the guesses are so good that I don't have to be involved with the system at all. So the parts look like this. We have um, corpus, information, corpus and information storage, which I use SQLite, uh, card matching, which I use libphash, OpenCV, which is for recognition of extracting the card from the image and cropping it. And we're going to look at all this. So first I had, I had to do some information gathering in order to get that, get that initial corpus of data. I'm going to talk about that. Information gathering, get it. <laughs> so the information that I needed to get was, this is, I wrote a web scraper that just goes and scrapes Magic, uh, Wizards of the Coast website, and I extract basically the name of the card, uh, I get the image, and I need to get the set, and I need to get the set because they repeat prints, so they'll print a card between sets, and maybe a card that's worth a lot of money, it'll be worth a lot more in an older set than in, say, a newer set, so knowing which sets it belongs to is important. Uh, then I also get the rating because I want to answer the question whether or not this card is any good, so I need to look that up. And I'm like, okay, great, this works perfectly, I know what I need. We have a card, it has one image, I set up the data model, like card, has one image, okay, it makes sense. Run, try to import all the data, it totally breaks. And it totally breaks because of this stupid thing, which is two cards with one image. There's literally two cards that are printed onto one card, so there's two unique cards, but they share the same image. So I'm like, okay, this breaks my stuff, I'll update my model. So we say, okay, an image has many cards, a card has one image, so we're good to go. So rerun the program, and of course it breaks again, the data model is wrong because of this stupid card, <laughs> which is one card with two images. <laughs> Never get the stupid data model right. So it turns out that it's basically image has, has and belongs to many cards, cards has and belongs to many image. So I want to talk about the scraping technologies that I use. Basically, I use promises in Ruby. Every, anyone know that Ruby has promises? Actually, how many JS programmers we have here? Yeah, you guys love promises, right? We got them too. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's look, at, let's look at what a promise is. So here's what a promise looks like. They're slightly different than the promises in JavaScript. We say, like, OK, promise.new, and then we can sleep for a while, you know, just do some computations inside the promise. We can get the status of the promise to tell whether or not it's running or completed. Uh, if we call dot value on the promise, it will return the value of the promise after the computation is performed. So basically, it will sit there and block until the computation is finished and then return the retur give you the return value of the computation. Uh, you can ask whether or not it's alive, or if you want to cancel the operation, you can call dot raise on it and stop halt operation of this uh, promise. So I'm going to show you the promise implementation. Um, that is it. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Enterprise code here. <laughs> All right, so the main problem with, with these promises is that you can have too many promises in the system. You can say, like, OK, create infinite number of promises. And obviously, since we all know the implementation of the promise system now, maybe that's not the most efficient way to do computations. <laughs> so what we would like to do is limit the number of promises we have running in the system. So in order to limit these promises, I, wrote, I put together this executor pool, which I'm just showing you to show how short it is. It's not very big. Basically what it is is it says, look, OK, I'm going to start up a pool of n threads. Excuse me, promises. OK. We're going to start up a, a pool of promises, and we're going to have those things pop off a queue for a particular size. And then our promise gets slightly more complicated. It looks like this. But we can say, like, well, we run the promise. When the promise gets run, we actually call the block that's instantiated with it. And when the other thread says, hey, give me the value of that, we just block until we've completed that, that uh, um, computation. So it waits on that latch. As soon as the latch is released and after the job is finished, then we actually get the, the value in the main thread. So what our, queue, our code looks like is we say, OK, let's queue up a bunch of these web requests, process all of those in parallel, and then ask for, the, ask for the value. So I can say, I only want you to process five of these things in parallel. So that's actually what I did is I said, OK, I want you to download a bunch of crap from this website, do, do five at a time. And this is me, this is a live action shot of me doing stuff, the wizards. 
was pretty amazing. Like there's all the threads going out, got a lot of data. Did it very quickly. I was able to download about 1.6 gigabytes of data from Wizards of the Coast in about 40 minutes or so. So I wondered if they noticed me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they did. Um, so that was really exciting. And then I found out about this other project. Like I did all that code, I downloaded all that data. Then I found out about this other project called mtgjson.com that actually has all of this data in JSON format. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just go download a zip file and you're done. <laughs> the moral of this story is try Google first. <laughs> All right, so let's look at let's look at perceptual hashing. So, perceptual hashing is how I take these cards and I say like, okay, I need to find a match in the database. I have a bunch of images and I want to find the one that corresponds to this. And we use uh, libphash from the fashion gem. Fashion wraps up libphash, and what libphash does is it calculates a hash for an image. Think of it exactly like you would calculate a hash for a key for a, um, a hash. So we have two images. On the left is our re reference image, and on the right is our scanned image. And you'll see down here at the bottom we've got two numbers. So what libphash does is it just generates this particular number for that particular card. So we've got that number here on the left for the reference image, and then the other number here on the right for the, my scanned image, the one that I've extracted. And you can ask phash to compute a Hamming distance between these two values. What the Hamming distance means is how many changes do I have to make in order to make these two things the same? Okay, so if I ask it for the Hamming distance, you'll see the Hamming distance here is eight. So that doesn't really mean anything, but if you compare that to something like this, like let's say we have a reference image here and then our scanned image on the right, we've got two different numbers for this. When we compute the Hamming distance for this, we'll see it's at 28. So the fewer changes required to make those images the same, the lower the number will be. So the lower the number is, the higher confident we are that we have a match for this. So the other thing that I added here is I added a, I extended SQLite to add a Hamming distance function in the database. There are about uh, 22,000 unique cards, and I need, so I need to be able to compare hashes between my scanned image and about 22,000 other cards. And it turned out that doing this in Ruby took a, a bit of time. So I wanted to do this in the database, which just stayed completely in C land. So I implemented this Hamming distance function. So I could actually say, OK, give me all the cards in the system, order by the Hamming distance, ascending, and then limit it to three. Give me the top three. So the next thing I needed to do is, I've got this giant corpus of images and I haven't calculated the hashes for them. I need to calculate hashes, so I wrote this code. I'm like, sweet, I'll calculate four hashes at a time. I've got four CPUs on my system. And as everybody knows, MRI has a GVL. So when I did this, here is my CPU. Extremely sad face. You can see that it's kind of a sad face shape there, right there. I'm only using 99% 99 of the, the CPU there. But what's interesting is that calculating this Hamming distance is a pure CPU process. It's a pure, we're only doing a, a computation on the CPU. And the important thing to note is that we don't ever actually have to re-enter the Ruby virtual machine when we calculate this hash. We can say, like, we just say, hey, call this C function, pass these numbers to the C function, and then the C function returns the number back. That's all it does. But what we can do is, if we know that we're not calling back into the virtual machine, we can say, hey, unlock the GVL. Call this function, then reacquire the GVL. So I sent a patch that did that for the gem, and now my processing looked exactly like this. I was using all four CPUs to calculate hashes for this. So I was able to get four times speed increase out of this. And I was like, yeah, threads, awesome. <laughs> so recognition and cropping. This is where we get to the extremely fun part, which is cargo culting. Um, it turns out, so I'm using OpenCV to do all this, to uh, find the card in the image, extract that card, and resize it. And it turns out that uh, when I'm using OpenCV, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> And if you go look for information on using OpenCV, you find tons and tons of cargo culted stuff. Like you'll find, and it's mostly in Python. It's either Python or C++, you'll find examples. And you're just like, I have no idea what's going on. So if you look at my, so if you go look at my project, you'll find code like, code that came from my repo. I got it from this guy's repo. I just translated his Python to Ruby. He got it from this repo. They got it from this place. They got it from this particular blog. And then the blog post doesn't explain it. And I'm like, what? 
I don't know. So I went and read the OpenCV code, and I'm going to hopefully explain it to you. Oh, also, they sell, O'Reilly sells an OpenCV book um, that's documentation on OpenCV. So you can go buy that. But what's cool is that the authors of the OpenCV book are also the authors of OpenCV. So a good, I think that a good thing to do, like if you want to make money off of open source, is to produce a popular project with no documentation and then write books. <laughs> <laughs> so like, there's your monetary like ways you can make money off of open source. Anyway, so my process is what I have is I have this image. I, this is what I've taken off of the webcam. I have this. And what I want is I need an image that looks like this. So back here you'll see like it's not, it's not rectangular. I'm pointing at an angle. Not only is it not rectangular, but it's kind of off, you know, it's off-centered there. And I need it to look like this so that I can compare against our reference images that look like that. So I take a photo, and I'm totally going to hand wave over this. If you go look at the code, because I don't have enough time, if you go look at the code for uh, the webcam thing, it looks like the process has died. Uh, anyway, if you go look at my webcam stuff, you'll see that what I'm using there. Anyway, it takes a photo. We have a photo. We need to pre-process it uh, by changing it to grayscale. And you do this in OpenCV. Just say, like, hey, um, go translate this image to grayscale. It gives you back a representation of that image as grayscale. And if you render it, it looks like that. It's just grayscale. So you need that grayscaled image because we need to do edge detection in the image. And OpenCV has what's called a canny, the canny edge detector. So you run canny edge detector against it. I have no idea how this algorithm works, but it's in Wikipedia there. You can go read it. Um, and if we output the image of that, we can see this is what it looks like. It's kind of faint. But all the white lines are all the images that are all the edges that it found in the image. So it, find, it found a bunch of images or edges in there. The next thing we need to do is we need to find contours. And this is what the code looks for this. You don't need to understand it. It is finding contours. Now, we find contours, and we need to find contours that are not holes. So contours would be like that edge that's all the way around the card, right? Or any kind of boxes that are in there. We need to find those particular contours. And we need to eliminate holes. Holes are contours that break up. They're, holes are like donuts, basically. Let me show you. So here's what our, here's what our card looks like. That edge around the outside there, that is an edge. That is an outer contour. That box inside there is a hole. So you can kind of think of it as a donut, right? We don't care about those contours that are inside the donut. We just want the outer donut contour. So if we plot all of those, it looks like this. These are all the contours that it finds. And we just need to find the largest one, because I've, I have this system controlled. I know that the largest contour is surrounding the card. So we just order by max contour area, and then we get that, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a green line all the way around that. That's our maximum contour. Then we turn it into a polygon. Uh, I like this part. This part's really cool because um, you say, give me a polygon. Give me a polygon for this. We're going to get a rectangle out of this uh, with four points on it. And if you go look at the source code for this, it's saying, OK, give me, a, give me a polygon for this, and I want the points in clockwise order. right? Now, what's super exciting about this code is even though you've asked it to give you the points in clockwise order, they are actually counterclockwise. <laughs> <laughs> really exciting. I have, I have no idea why. There's a specific constant in C, and it even says in the documentation, you pass this in, it's clockwise. But I feel like I'm not, an, I'm not an, a vision expert. I'm not a computer vision expert, right? But when I look at it, they're, they're counterclockwise, though somebody pointed it out to me that if you look, if you turn your computer around and face it to somebody else, they are, in fact, clockwise. <laughs> anyway, so that's why I have to reverse the points over there is to get them, get them to be clockwise. And if we plot those four points we get out of it, you can see it's matching up with the four corners of the card there. Now, the final problem that we need to solve for this is the card is not rectangular. So what we do is we say, hey, OpenCV, uh, here are points. Here are some points that form a rectangle. So I start at 0, 0. Here's an array of these points. Zero, starting at 0, 0, we say give it a width, give it a height. Now give me a matrix that knows how to warp this image such that um, we get this rectangle out of it. So we get that, we get that uh, warp matrix out of there. So we got our warp <laughs> matrix. And then we say, OK, go ahead and warp the image with that, with that particular matrix. And if we plot the output of this, there we can see our card. 
That is what the image looks like. The image is basically messed up, except that the card is now rectangular and it is positioned at 0, 0 in the image. So we can say, OK, give me my return on investment, uh, which is actually a region of interest. <laughs> uh, give me, I want this area from 0, 0 down to this other, other rectangular point. Just give me that section of the image, and finally we have our card out of it. It's just that easy. <laughs> So our card matching, <laughs> here's what our card matching looks like. We just say, OK, here's the, calculate the hash for that particular image, go to the database, sort all the, sort all the records by, that, by distance from that hash, save the card. And I'm also going to hand wave over that, because I'm sure all of you know how to save stuff to a database, hopefully. Uh, so then finally, this is, what our, this is what our match looks like. Like, OK, there we can see on the right, I'm actually doing it. And I mentioned that these cards, after I save it, they become part of the corpus. And you can see after I save that, now I've got two of those cards there. Saying, OK, that's part of the corpus now. I'm matching against it, and it matches very well. I don't know if I do any more in here. I think that's enough example. Uh, so I can answer the question like, OK, what do I have? I can easily answer that. I can say, well, I've, I've scanned all these images. I know what I have. I can also answer, how good are they? I can say, OK, r order these by their rating. Tell me all my cards and order them by rating so I can get my best card and my worst card. This is my best card, the best card I own. If you play Magic, you know this is a pretty, pretty good card. Uh, this is the worst card I own. If you play Magic, you may not know this card at all it's because it's totally terrible. <laughs> um, and as for how much money they're worth, uh, I have no idea because I haven't integrated with any like pricing systems yet, although it looks like you can do that. Uh, there's, there are pricing websites out there. I just haven't integrated that into my system. Uh, some of the challenges that I have with this system, some of the things that I'm actually working on right now are like time to focus. If you look at the camera, so look at the live feed on the right there, you'll see when I place a card underneath there, uh, it takes time for the webcam to actually zoom in on it and focus. So that takes time. And it, I mean, you think, oh, it's focusing pretty quickly, but when you have 6,000 cards, that's not fast enough. Um, sometimes I have total failure. So let's say I put a card underneath there, like I'll put a card inside, like please identify this, and you'll see none of those cards there are mine. None of the ones, none of those are what I want. Um, the good news, though, is that when I teach it the right thing, when I tell it what this card is, the next time it gets it dead on. So that's the good news from this, although it does suck that it's just sitting there like, I don't know what this is. The other challenge to overcome is similar artwork. These are all different cards, <laughs> but they look almost exactly the same. So that it's very hard to keep, you know, very hard to tell those cards apart. And finally, my cat me keeps moving stuff around. He's like, hey, look at this box. <laughs> hey, there's a little thing, camera cables. I love cables. It's great. Anyway, so the, those are the challenges I have with it. So thank you very much. Um, I have stickers of my cat, if you would like a sticker of the cat. Um, so thank you.